introduction osiris and the resurrection of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge introduction osiris and resurrection it will be noticed in reading the translation of the book of the dead given in this volume that the deceased is always identified with the god osiris and that he is frequently called by the god's name and if the religious texts written for the benefit of the dead in all periods be examined it will be found that from the fifth dynasty to the latest times osiris is always regarded as the king and god of the dead and that egyptian writers always assume the identity of the blessed dead with their god thus in the text inscribed on the pyramid of unas the writer identifies the king with the god osiris and says to the god tem o tem behold thy son this motionless osiris thou hast given him that whereon he may live if he liveth this unas liveth if he dieth not this unas dieth not if he perisheth not this unas perisheth not if he begetteth not this unas begetteth not if he begetteth this unas begetteth and throughout the religious literature the deceased always claims that whatever was done by the gods for osiris should also be done for him by them the hymns addressed to ra and other great gods dwell more on the majesty and power which they exhibit in heaven and upon earth than upon their goodness to man but with osiris the case is different and it is evident that in the earliest period he was regarded more in the light of a god who could be known and who was known more or less personally if we may use the word and he was of all the gods the one singled out to receive the petitions of mankind for everlasting life it is impossible to say when osiris began to be regarded as the god of the dead and it is only from brief allusions that any history of him can be formed throughout the egyptian texts it is assumed that the god suffered death and mutilation at the hands of his enemies that the various members of his body were scattered about the land of egypt that his sister wife isis sought him sorrowing and at length found him that she fanned him with her wings and gave him air that she raised up his body and was united unto him that she conceived and brought forth a child horus and that he osiris became the god and king of the underworld in the legend of osiris as given by plutarch de iside et osiride it is said that he was murdered at the instigation of typhon or set who tore the body into fourteen pieces which he scattered throughout the land isis collected these pieces and wherever she found one she built a tomb after the death of osiris his son horus did battle with typhon his father's murderer and in the words of the egyptians avenged his father notwithstanding the death and mutilation which the god suffered the egyptians firmly believed that he rose from the dead with a body perfect in all its members and that corruption and decay had no power over him this fact may be deduced from a large number of passages in texts of all periods but in one in particular which forms part of chapter one hundred and fifty four of the book of the dead a definite statement of it occurs the deceased says to osiris do thou embalm these my members for i would not perish and come to an end but would be even likened to my divine father kepera who is the divine type of him that never saw corruption let not my body become worms but deliver me as thou didst deliver thyself homage to thee o my divine father osiris thou hast thy being with thy members thou didst not decay thou didst not become worms thou didst not waste away thou didst not become corruption thou didst not putrefy and thou didst not turn into worms i am the god kepera and my members shall have an everlasting experience i shall not decay i shall not rot i shall not putrefy i shall not turn into worms and i shall not see corruption beneath 
the eye of the god shu i shall have my being i shall have my being i shall live i shall live i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall germinate i shall wake up in peace i shall not putrefy my intestines shall not perish i shall not suffer from any defect mine eye shall not decay the form of my visage shall not disappear mine ear shall not become deaf my head shall not be separated from my neck my tongue shall not be carried away my hair shall not be cut off mine eyebrows shall not be shaved off and no baleful injury shall come upon me my body shall be established and it shall neither fall into decay nor be destroyed upon this earth the oldest copy of this chapter is inscribed upon one of the wrappings of the mummy of tothmes the third who reigned about b c one thousand five hundred and fifty and the latest is found in the turin papyrus edited by lepsius in eighteen forty two which dates from the ptolemaic period from these extracts we see that the deceased bases his certainty of an everlasting life which was to be lived in a body which was perfect in all its members upon the assurance that osiris died and rose again and lived in a body which was perfect in all its members and it followed for the egyptian that if osiris did not die and rise again his belief in a resurrection was vain it is difficult to say with certainty whether the ancient egyptian believed that osiris endured pain and suffered death on his behalf or not but it is quite clear that he believed there was some very definite connection between the resurrection of osiris and of himself and also that the god was able to raise him up and to give him everlasting life because he himself had conquered death and risen and had become the master of everlasting life if the legend of plutarch which states that osiris was once a man who lived upon earth really represents an egyptian belief we may perhaps conclude that the manhood which was common to the god and to the suppliant supplied the reason why the prayers which are put into the mouth of the dead are always addressed to osiris at all events closer personal relations existed between man and osiris than between man and any other god moreover for countless generations he was the type and emblem of the resurrection and relying upon his power to give immortality to man untold generations lived and died the ceremonies connected with the celebration of the sufferings death and resurrection of osiris were performed with great solemnity and it has been thought that a representation of them took place annually in certain of his shrines the forms in which osiris is depicted on the monuments and in papyri are very numerous but we need only refer here to those which concern him in his character as king god and judge of the dead in papyri he is seated on a throne within a covered shrine his form is that of a bearded mummy wearing the atef crown and he holds in his hands the crook and flail or whip emblems of sovereignty and dominion on the side of the throne which rests upon a pedestal made in the form of a parallelogram the symbol of that which is straight or right is the emblem of the union of southern and northern egypt which typifies the sovereignty of the god over the whole land the throne is sometimes placed upon water wherein we may probably see the origin of the tradition of certain eastern peoples which makes the throne of the deity to rest above running water behind him frequently stand the goddesses isis and nephthys and facing him standing upon a lotus flower are the four children of horus thus seated praise was offered to him in these words glory be to thee o cyrus un nefer the great god within abydos king of eternity lord of the everlasting who passeth through millions of years in his existence praise be unto thee osiris lord of eternity un nefer harmachus whose forms are manifold and whose attributes are majestic those who have lain down that is the dead rise up to see thee they breathe the air and they look upon thy face when the disk riseth on its horizon their hearts are at peace inasmuch as they behold thee o thou who art eternity and everlastingness in an address to osiris by thoth which forms the 
one hundred and eighty second chapter of the book of the dead he is said to be the governor of those who are in the underworld and to make men and women to be born again the new birth being the birth into the life which is beyond the grave and being himself everlasting he had power to bestow eternal existence upon his followers concerning the form in which osiris rose from the dead the texts are silent and nothing is said as to the nature of his body in the underworld that he dwelt in the material body which was his upon earth there is no reason whatever to suppose for there are indications in the texts which point to a definite belief in the resurrection of a spiritual body both in the case of the god and of men before however this point is touched upon reference must be made to the ideas which the egyptians held concerning the component parts of man's entity material spiritual and mental the physical or material body called khat was liable to decay and could only be preserved by mummifying both gods and man possessed bodies of this nature when the material body had been brought to the tomb for burial provided that the prescribed prayers had been said over it and the proper ceremonies had been duly performed by the priests it acquired the power of sending forth from itself a body called sahu which was able to ascend to heaven and to dwell with the gods there the only suitable rendering for the word sahu is spiritual body and this meaning fits very well into the translation of the text where the word is found the educated egyptian never believed that the material body would rise again and take up a new life for he well understood that flesh and blood could not inherit immortality it has been urged by some that the custom of mummifying the dead which obtained throughout egypt for so many thousands of years was maintained because the egyptian believed in the resurrection of the material body but it is not so they mummified their dead simply because they believed that spiritual bodies would germinate in them in several places it is distinctly said that the soul is in heaven and the body upon earth and even the dead body of osiris himself rested upon earth in heliopolis elsewhere it is said to the deceased thy soul is in heaven before ra thy ka hath what should be given to it with the gods thy sahu hath power or is glorious with the khus and thy body kat is established in the underworld tuat it is possible that certain simple folk may have been led to believe that because meat offerings and drink offerings in abundance were taken to the tombs the deceased must naturally partake of them and it is more than probable that the egyptians in a semi-savage state made such offerings because they believed them necessary for their dead the offerings taken to the tomb were intended for the ka of the deceased the word ka has formed the subject of several learned dissertations by various scholars and it is now generally rendered by double it has its equivalent in the coptic ro and in the greek elaukon and in certain places may be rendered by all the meanings of these equivalents this abstract individuality or personality possessed all the attributes of the man himself and though its normal dwelling-place was in the tomb along with the body it could wander about at will it was independent of the man to whom it belonged and could even go and dwell in the statue of a man the ka could both eat and drink and at a very early period a small chamber was specially prepared for it in the hall of the tomb this was provided with an opening through which it might snuff the smell of the incense and other offerings made therein and it was the duty of certain members to minister duly and regularly to its needs when actual offerings failed it would seem that the ka fed upon those which were painted or sculptured upon the walls and altars in the tomb and when these were wanting it appears that it might even be reduced to eating offal and drinking filthy water connected in some inexplicable way with the ka was the ba or soul which according to some texts is said to eat of the funeral offerings along with the ka in whom or with whom it was supposed to dwell but according to others it ascended into heaven where it lived with ra and the beautiful dead from one point of view it is not a material thing and from another it is a tangible thing it is depicted as a 
human-headed hawk and in a vignette in the papyrus of nebket it is seen flying down the funeral pit bearing air and food to the mummified body lying in the mummy chamber to which it belongs the ba could leave its place in heaven and visit the body whenever it pleased and it had power to assume any form which it pleased certain of the characteristics of the ba were shared by the heart ab which was believed to be the source both of life and of good and evil in man the preservation of the heart was of the first importance and several chapters of the book of the dead were composed with the object of keeping it out of the clutches of the stealers of hearts in the judgment scene it is the one member of the body which is singled out for a special examination and the large numbers of heart amulets which are preserved in the national collections of egyptian antiquities testify to the anxiety which the egyptians felt as to its security with the ba or soul the kaya bit or shadow is often mentioned and it seems to have been nourished by the offerings which were made in the tomb of the man to whom it belonged it had an existence apart from the body and like the ka or double it could wander wherever it pleased an interesting passage concerning the shadow is found in the ninety-second chapter of the book of the dead where the deceased prays o keep not captive my soul o keep not ward over my shadow but let a way be opened for my soul and for my shadow and let them see the great god in the shrine on the day of the judgment of souls and let them recite the utterances of osiris whose habitations are hidden to those who guard the members of osiris and who keep ward over the khus and who hold captive the shadows of the dead who would work evil against me another integral part of a man was the khu or shining translucent covering of the spiritual body which dwelt in heaven with the gods it is difficult to explain its exact relationship to the double and the soul and the heart and the shadow but in certain passages in which the word occurs it seems as if it had some close connection with the soul for it is mentioned along with it in several passages both in early and late texts the sekum of a man is mentioned with the ba or soul and sometimes with both the ka or double and the ba one of the meanings of sekum is form or statue but another meaning is power and it seems as if the egyptians conceived the idea of the power or vital force of a man living with him in heaven the gods were supposed to possess doubles and souls and shadows and hearts and khus but it is doubtful if they were endowed with sekum it is probable that they were not many of them were themselves sekum or powers there remains now but one attribute of a man to mention and that is the ren or name in egypt a man took the most extraordinary precautions to prevent his name from being blotted out for it was the common belief that unless the name of a person were preserved he ceased to exist already in the pyramid texts as dr wiedemann has pointed out we find the deceased making supplication that his name may flourish literally germinate along with the names of tem shu seb and other gods and the same desire is expressed in texts from the sixth dynasty down to the roman period when we find that a number of papyri were inscribed with invocations to one or more gods with the sole object of making to flourish the names of those for whom they were copied the ren or name had some close connection with the ka or double as may be seen from the passage in the text of pepi the first thus we see that the sahu or spiritual body the ka or double the ba or soul the ab or heart the ku or shining form the sekum or vital force and the ren or name and the kai bit or shade were all believed to come into existence after death and it seems that the various parts which we have enumerated together made up the spiritual body which germinated in the cot or material body there is little doubt that the beliefs in the existence of these various members of the spiritual body are not all of the same age and they probably represent several stages of intellectual development on the part of the egyptian their origin and development it is now impossible to trace 
for already in the fifth and sixth dynasties their existence is accepted as an accomplished fact a question naturally arises at this point as to when this spiritual body began its existence but unfortunately no satisfactory answer can at present be given to it for no text yet discovered supplies the necessary information it is natural to suppose that the sahu or spiritual body came into being as a result of the prayers which were recited on the day of the burial of the mummified body and of the ceremonies which were performed at the same time on the other hand there exists distinct proofs that the egyptians believed in a judgment which was to be held in the domain of osiris and we should hardly expect the spiritual body to begin its career until after the trial of the heart in the balance and until the verdict of the gods at this judgment was favourable to the deceased the whole question is full of difficulty chiefly because the egyptians themselves did not i imagine form definite ideas on such subjects or if they did they did not put them in writing it is however perfectly certain that they believed that osiris had the power to make men to be born after death into a new life and that such life was everlasting and they ascribed to him this power because he had himself suffered death and mutilation and had risen from the dead end of introduction osiris and resurrection introduction the judgment of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge introduction the judgment of the dead an examination of the papyri inscribed with the theban recension of the book of the dead shows that they may be divided into two classes these one those in which the chapters of coming forth by day are preceded by introductory hymns to ra and osiris and by a judgment scene and two those in which they are preceded by a simple vignette in which the god osiris is seen seated within a shrine the oldest papyri of the eighteenth dynasty lack such introductory hymns and the judgment scene which appear most often in the illuminated papyri of the last half of the eighteenth dynasty they continue in the nineteenth dynasty but frequently in a less full form in the older recensions of the book of the dead there is no attempt to describe the judgment pictorially and although it is pretty certain that every egyptian believed that he would be judged after death there is no definite statement of the fact it will be noticed that a section of chapter thirty b contains the words my heart my mother my heart my mother my heart whereby i came into being may naught stand up to oppose me at my judgment may there be no opposition to me in the presence of the sovereign princes of osiris may there be no parting of thee from me in the presence of him that keepeth the balance let there be joy of heart unto us at the weighing of words let not that which is false be uttered against me before the great god the lord of amentet here clearly we have suggested the idea of weighing the heart as the symbol of the seed of life and the source of good and evil actions and as a matter of fact the vignette of the chapter which first appears in the eighteenth dynasty represents the deceased sitting in one pan of the scales and being weighed against his heart which is placed in the other it is not easy to say exactly what belief underlies this vignette but it seems to indicate that the guardian of the scale weighed the body to see if it had carried out properly the heart's directions and that if it had done so it would counterbalance exactly the heart and the beam of the scales would be straight this testing of the body or heart or both took place in the presence of osiris on the day when words were weighed in the papyrus of ani four small vignettes 
accompany the negative confession which forms part of the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter and in one of these we see the heart of the deceased in one pan of the balance and a feather emblematic of right and truth that is what is straight in the other the god anubis is testing the tongue of the balance and close by stands the monster am met or eater of the dead here we have a proof that in addition to the weighing of a man's body against his heart the heart itself was weighed against right and truth and that this stage of the judgment also took place in the presence of the god osiris the judge of the dead in the eighteenth dynasty if not earlier the idea of the judgment took great hold upon the minds of the egyptians and it found expression in the large and elaborate vignette which is prefixed to the copies of the chapters of coming forth by day which were made at this period it is however impossible to say whether the large vignette is a development of that which accompanies the one hundred and twenty fifth chapter or whether each had a distinct origin when once the idea of the great judgment scene had developed itself it seems to have been felt that the deceased ought not to enter into the hall of judgment without having first uttered words of prayer and praise to the great gods ra and osiris to the former as the greatest of the cosmic gods and to the latter as the judge and god of the dead hence were composed the introductory hymns to ra and osiris of which several examples are known in the hymns to ra the deceased apostrophizes the glory and majesty of the one god the creator of the world and all that therein is who manifests himself to his creatures under the form of the sun and by whose heat and light men and women beasts and feathered fowl fish and creeping things trees and herbs have their being the darkness of night into which the sun disappeared when he set was personified as an enemy of the sun and the daily victory of light over darkness was hymned with gladness by his worshippers from one point of view the egyptian regarded the course of the sun as a type of his own life and day symbolized life and night death the conflict in which the sun engaged with the powers of darkness typified the struggle of the deceased with his enemies in the underworld and man hoped that he would overcome them even as the sun vanquished all who opposed his course in a fine hymn the deceased says o thou beautiful being thou dost renew thyself in thy season in the form of the disc within thy mother hathor therefore in every place every heart swelleth with joy at thy rising eternally o ra the divine man-child the heir of eternity self-begotten and self-born prince of the tuat governor of the regions of okert thou god of life thou lord of love all men live when thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods those who are in thy following sing unto thee with joy and bow down their foreheads to the earth when they meet thee thou lord of heaven thou lord of earth thou king of right and truth thou lord of eternity thou prince of everlastingness thou sovereign of all the gods thou god of life thou creator of eternity thou maker of heaven wherein thou art firmly established the company of the gods rejoice at thy rising the earth is glad when it beholdeth thy rays the peoples that have been long dead come forth with cries of joy to see thy beauties daily the serpent fiend that is darkness hath fallen his arms are hewn off the knife hath cut asunder his joints ra liveth in unchanging and eternal law and order again in another hymn we read thou risest thou risest thou shinest thou shinest thou art crowned king of the gods thou art the lord of heaven thou art the lord of earth thou art the creator of beings celestial and of beings terrestrial 
thou art the one god who came into being in the beginning of time thou didst create the earth thou didst fashion man thou didst make the watery abyss of the sky thou didst form hapi that is the nile thou didst create the watery abyss and didst give life to all that therein is thou hast knit together the mountains thou hast made mankind and the beast of the field to come into being thou hast made the heavens and the earth thou art crowned prince of heaven thou art the one dowered with all sovereignty who comest forth from the sky ra is victorious o thou divine youth thou heir literally flesh and bone of everlastingness thou self-begotten one o thou who didst give thyself birth o one mighty one of myriad forms and aspects king of the world prince of anu lord of eternity and ruler of everlastingness the company of the gods rejoice when thou risest and when thou sailest across the sky thou art unknown and no tongue is worthy to declare thy likeness only thou thyself canst do this thou hearest with thine ears and thou seest with thine eyes millions of years have gone over the world i cannot tell the number of those through which thou hast passed from these passages it is clear that the egyptians believed that the god who was typified by the sun was eternal immortal and unknown that is invisible that he created himself and the world and the beings and things in it he was also one and alone and there was none like unto him for the gods of whom he was king only possessed certain of his attributes and characteristics it had been denied by some that his oneness or unity is the same as the unity of god almighty though i believe there is no good reason for this view but whether it be or not it is perfectly certain that when the egyptians declared that their god was one they meant exactly what the hebrews meant when they declared that jehovah was one and what the arabs meant and still mean when they cry out that allah is one at all events the one god of the egyptians possessed all the essential attributes of the christian's god in the hymns to osiris the deceased enumerates the various titles of the god and mentions his most ancient shrines osiris is declared to be the son of seb the earth god and of nut the sky goddess and as prince of gods and men to have received the crook and the whip and the dignity of his divine fathers he is the king of eternity and lord of everlastingness and his existence is for millions of years in his name osiris he is most terrible and he endureth for ever in his name unnefer though possessing the attribute of eternal which is ascribed to ra he is not self-begotten and self-born like that god ra has no offspring in the human sense of the word but osiris begot a son after his death according to one legend who succeeded to his father's throne upon earth and avenged him on set his murderer from ra the deceased asks only that he may behold him at dawn each day but from osiris he asks that his ka or double may have splendour in heaven and might upon earth and triumph in the underworld and he adds may i sail down to tatu mendes or busiris like a living soul and up to abtu abydos like a benu bird may i go in and come out without repulse at the pylons of the lords of the underworld may there be given unto me loaves of bread in the house of coolness and offerings of food in anu heliopolis and a homestead for ever in Sekhet aru with wheat and barley therefore judging by the arrangement of the papyrus of ani the papyrus of hugh nefer the papyrus of kenna and other documents of the period it seems pretty clear that the introductory hymns and the vignette of the judgment scene together formed a special section of the fine papyri of the theban recension 
the vignette of the judgment scene varies in detail greatly in the various papyri though the essential parts of it are always preserved the fullest form known of it is given in the papyrus of ani and may be thus described in one portion of a chamber in the domain of osiris which we may assume to be the hall of the double maat or right and truth a balance is set wherein the heart of the deceased is to be weighed the beam of the balance is suspended upon a projection from the standard made in the form of the feather which symbolizes right and truth upon the beam of the balance sits the dog-headed ape which was associated with thoth the scribe of the gods the weighing of the heart is carried out in the presence of the company of the gods which is here represented by the following members of it one ra heru kuti or ra hamarchus the great god within his boat this boat was called the bark of millions of years and there sat in it along with ra the gods kepera and tem his own forms in the morning and evening respectively two temu or tem the form of ra at eventide he was the head of the company of gods at heliopolis and is always represented in human form this fact indicates that already in the earliest times known to us he had gone through all the various stages through which gods pass and had assumed a final and definite form three shu the son of ra and hathor who lifted up the goddess nut or the sky from the embrace of seb the earth god he typified the light for tefnut the twin sister of shu she is depicted as a woman with the head of a lioness she typified moisture five seb the earth god the son of shu husband of nut and by her father of osiris and isis set and nephthys six nut the female counterpart of nu or the watery mass from which all the gods were evolved and upon which the bark of millions of years floated seven isis the sister wife of osiris the mother of horus son of isis she probably typified the dawn eight nephthys daughter of seb and nut sister of osiris and isis and the sister wife of set she is also said to be the mother of anubis by osiris she probably typified eventide or twilight nine horus the sun god who is to be distinguished from horus the son of isis he is represented in human form but with the head of a hawk the hawk was the symbol of horus and the worship of that bird is probably the oldest in egypt ten hathor the goddess of that portion of the sky wherein horus the sun god rose and set eleven hue and sa two gods who had their places in the boat of the sun at creation it will be noticed that several of the gods for example nu ptah kenimu kepera set anpu apuat amsu hapi and several goddesses for example maat nit sekhet bast serk uachit are not here represented the explanation of this fact is that only the gods and the goddesses of the funeral company of osiris are considered to be interested in the judgment of the dead on one side of the scale we see the god anubis testing the tongue of the balance and behind him stand thoth the scribe of the gods writing down the result of the weighing and the triform beast Amit, the eater of the dead who is waiting to devour the heart of ani should it be found light in the balance on the other side of the balance are ani's luck or destiny an object called meskin which has been described as a cubit with human head it either typifies the embryo or has some connection with the birth of ani his soul in the form of a human-headed bird perched upon a pylon and behind these are the goddesses renanet and mekhenet who presided over ani's birth-chamber and rearing behind these stand ani himself and his wife thu thu with heads reverently bent 
ani is here depicted in human form and wearing garments and ornaments similar to those which he wore upon earth it is quite clear that the body which he has in this hall of judgment cannot be the body with which he had been endowed upon earth and we are probably to understand that it is his spiritual body wearing the white robes of the beatified dead in the world beyond the grave which we see he is perfect in all his members which are endowed with the strength and power that belong to those who have risen in a spiritual or glorified body from the dead though he stands at the entrance of the hall and the weighing of the heart has not yet taken place the artist depicted him in the form in which it was always assumed the just would appear before osiris the heart having been placed in one pan of the scales and the feather symbolic of truth in the other ani utters the words which form chapter thirty b of the book of the dead wherein he prays that there may be no parting of his heart from him in the presence of the guardian of the balance this done anubis tests the tongue of the balance and finds that the beam is exactly straight and that the heart balances the feather exactly the dog-headed ape seated on the standard reports this to thoth who standing with his writing reed in hand is ready to note the result and to declare it to the gods it is interesting to observe that the heart was only required to balance the feather and not to outweigh it a fact which indicates that the pious egyptian was supposed to be able to satisfy the demands and requirements of the law and that he took his stand in the judgment and hoped for acquittal by virtue of the good deeds which he had done in the body the god thoth next addressed the company of the gods as follows hear ye this judgment the heart of osiris hath in very truth been weighed and his soul hath stood as a witness for him it hath been found true by trial in the great balance there hath not been found any wickedness in him he hath not wasted the offerings in the temples he hath not done harm by his deeds and he spread no evil reports about men while he was upon earth to this speech the gods reply that which cometh forth from thy mouth o thoth dwelling in kamennu is confirmed osiris the scribe ani is holy and righteous he hath not sinned neither hath he done evil against us the devourer amemet shall not be allowed to prevail over him and meat offerings and entrance into the presence of the god osiris shall be granted unto him together with a homestead for ever in sekhet hetepu as unto the followers of horus the gods confirm the report of thoth and ani having been found just is led into the presence of osiris by horus the son of isis the words found just represent in a measure the words ma keru or ma ut keru masculine feminine which are always added after the name of the deceased in funeral texts there is no example of their application to a living person much has been written about them and many renderings have been suggested for them such as true of voice justified triumphant victorious they actually mean right ma and word keru and seem to be meant to express the belief on the part of the writer that the deceased has satisfactorily passed the ordeal of judgment and that he has attained to the state in which his commands whatever they may be will be carried out duly and effectually while horus is leading ani into the presence of his father he addresses osiris saying i have come unto thee o unnefer and i have brought thee osiris ani unto thee his heart has been found righteous coming forth from the balance and it hath not sinned against any god or goddess thoth hath waited according to the decree uttered unto him by the company of the gods and it is very true and righteous grant unto him cakes and ale and let him enter into the presence of osiris that is into thy presence and may he be like unto the followers of horus for ever in the last division of the judgment scene we see ani kneeling by a table of offerings placed before the shrine of the god osiris to whom he says o lord of 
amentet i am in thy presence there is no sin in me i have not lied wittingly nor have i done aught with a false heart grant that i may be like unto those favoured ones who are round about thee and that i may be an osiris greatly favoured of the beautiful god and beloved of the lord of the world the royal scribe indeed who loveth him ani triumphant before the god osiris it will be noticed that ani now has his hair whitened and that he wears upon his head the object which is called a comb the signification of which is unknown he has at length penetrated to the throne of osiris the lord of eternity as the words written above read and ani's petition to the god is that he may become an osiris that is to say a being endowed with a spiritual body which can never again see death or suffer corruption the answer of osiris is not given in the papyrus nor is it as far as i have seen in any papyrus where a similar petition is made but just as it is always assumed that the heart of the deceased will always balance the feather of law or right and truth so is it also assumed that the petition of the deceased will always be favourably received and that he will henceforth be free to go about in the god's domains without let or hindrance and to participate in all the occupations of the great god himself thus the judgment scene ends and this section of the papyrus in which it is found is followed by the chapters of coming forth by day the question naturally arises here when did the judgment in the hall of osiris take place to this no definite answer can be given for the reason that no text supplies the information needed there are no grounds so far as i see for assuming that the egyptians believed in a great general day of judgment when all the world shall be judged and the wicked shall be punished and the righteous shall be rewarded or for thinking as some have done that the mummified bodies were laid in the tomb to await a general resurrection on the contrary all the evidence seems to point to the conclusion that the judgment of each individual was thought to take place immediately after death and if this was the belief it follows that punishment or reward was allotted to the dead at once the evil heart or the heart which had failed to balance the feather symbolic of the law was given to the monster amit to devour thus punishment consisted of instant annihilation unless we imagine that the destruction of the heart was extended over an indefinite period the difficulty of the subject is further complicated when we come to consider the use and object of the funeral ceremonies and prayers if at his death the soul of a man passed to immediate judgment what could the ceremonies and prayers of the priests avail it we know that the embalming of a body in the best and most expensive way occupied a period varying from seventy to about one hundred days and that several more days were necessary before the body was coffined and laid with the proper ceremonies in the tomb if the prayers which the priests recited and the ceremonies which they performed over it at the grave were absolutely necessary for the future well-being of its soul and if the soul could not begin its beatified existence until such prayers had been said and such ceremonies had been performed it is difficult to understand why such a lengthy process of embalmment was resorted to for during the period which elapsed between death and burial the soul must have tarried in some intermediate place in the absence of exact knowledge we can only assume that certain prayers were said for the benefit of the deceased immediately after death and that such prayers assured his acquittal in the hall of osiris and procured for him entrance into the abode of the blessed this done the embalmment of the body might be carried out at the convenience of all concerned and the elaborate and formal ceremonies connected with the sepulture of the great would follow in due course the beliefs which are connected with the judgment of the dead are so numerous and so conflicting and belong to so many various periods of development of religious thought in egypt that it is impossible to harmonize them as new texts are 
discovered the difficulties will probably disappear one by one and the future labours of egyptologists will clear up many obscure passages which up to the present have been misunderstood End of introduction the judgment introduction the elysian fields of the egyptian book of the dead by e a wallace budge the elysian fields of heaven at a very early period in their history the egyptians believed in the existence of a place wherein the blessed dead led a life of happiness the characteristics of which much resemble those of the life which he had led upon earth these characteristics are so similar that it is hard to believe that in the early times the one life was not held to be a mere continuation of the other at all events the delights and pleasures of this world were believed to be forthcoming in the next and a life there in a state of happiness which depended absolutely upon material things was contemplated such ideas date from the time when the egyptians were in a semi-savage state and the preservation of them is probably due to their extreme conservatism in all matters connected with religion the remarkable point about them is their persistence for they occur in texts which belong to periods when it was impossible for the egyptians to have attached any serious importance to them and some of the coarsest ideas are in places mingled with the expression of lofty spiritual conceptions in a passage in the text of Eunus, it is said of this king Eunus hath come to his pools which are on both sides of the stream of the goddess metert and to the place of verdant offerings and to the fields which are on the horizon he hath made his fields on both sides of the horizon to be verdant he hath brought the crystal to the great eye which is in the field he hath taken his seat in the horizon he riseth like sebek the son of neath he eateth with his mouth he voideth water he enjoyeth the pleasures of love and he is the begetter who carrieth away women from their husbands whenever it pleaseth him so to do and in the text of teta we read hail osiris teta horus hath granted that thoth shall bring thine enemy unto thee he hath placed thee behind him that he may not harm thee and that thou mayest make thy seat upon him and that when coming forth thou mayest sit upon him so that he may not be able to force intercourse upon thee these passages give a very clear idea of the state of egyptian morals when they were written and they indicate the indignities to which those vanquished in war both male and female were exposed at the hands of the conquerors the texts of the early period as will be seen from the extracts given further on give a large amount of information about the pleasures of the deceased in the world beyond the grave but no attempt to illustrate the employments of the blessed dead is given until the eighteenth dynasty when the vignette to the one hundred and tenth chapter of the book of the dead was inserted in papyri here we have an idea given of the conception which the egyptian formed of the place wherein he was to dwell after death a homestead or farm or country intersected with canals is at once his paradise and the home of the blessed dead and the abode of the god of his city this place is called seket aru or field of reeds and this name seems to indicate that the egyptian placed his paradise in the north of egypt probably in some part of the delta or in the islands of the sea still further north certain it is that the deceased prays several times that the sweet breath of the north wind may be given unto him and those who have experienced the discomfort of a south wind on a hot day in egypt will sympathize with him the fields of reeds however was but a portion of the district called seket hetep or seket hetepet 
or fields of peace over which there presided a number of gods and here the deceased led a life which suggests that the idea of the whole place originated with a nation of agriculturists in the coloured vignette which faces chapter one hundred and ten the scribe ani is seen being introduced to the gods of sekhet hetep by thoth who accompanies him to smooth his way and to do for him all that he did for osiris next we see him sailing in a boat laden with offerings which he is bearing to the hawk god lower down we see him reaping wheat and driving the oxen which tread out the corn and beyond that he is kneeling before two heaps of grain one red and one white in the next division he is ploughing the land of sekhet anru or sekhet aru by the side of a stream of vast length and unknown breadth and which contains neither worm nor fish in the fourth division is the abode of the god osiris and here are the places where dwell those who are nourished upon divine food and the spiritual bodies of the dead in one section of this division the deceased placed the god of his city so that even in respect of his religious observances his life might be as perfect as it was upon earth his wishes in the matter of the future life are well expressed in the following prayer let me be rewarded with thy fields o god hetep that which is thy wish shalt thou do o lord of the winds may i become a ku therein may i eat therein may i drink therein may i plough therein may i reap therein may i fight therein may i make love therein may my words be mighty therein may i never be in a state of servitude therein but may i have authority therein elsewhere in the same chapter the deceased addresses the gods of the various lakes and sections of the elysian fields and he states that he has bathed in the holy lake that all uncleanness has departed from him and that he has arrayed himself in the apparel of ra in his new life even amusements are provided but they are the amusements of earth for he snares feathered fowl and sails about in his boat catching worms and serpents a remarkable passage in the text of unas describes the deceased king as a soul in the form of a god who devours his fathers and mothers and mankind generally and gods he hunts and entraps the gods in the plains of the next world and having tied them securely he slays and disembowels them the choice portions of their bodies he boils and consumes at his meals at dawn eventide and midnight the remainder he burns to heat the cauldrons he eats the hearts carefully so that he may absorb the vital powers of the gods and by eating other portions also he acquires all the attributes of the god inasmuch as he has eaten the bodies of the gods he becomes indeed a god and since they possess the attribute of everlasting life and could not die again the king becomes straightway possessed of their attributes here again we have a trace of a savage custom namely that of cutting out a portion of some intestine of a foe and eating it in order to acquire his mental and physical powers such a custom must have disappeared from egypt long before the monuments known to us were made and it is hard to understand the retention of such a notion in a text filled with sublime thoughts and ideas in the texts of all periods we read often that the deceased lives with ra that he stands among the company of the gods and that he is one like unto the divine beings who dwell with them but little is told us concerning his intercourse with those whom he has known upon earth and if it were not for some two or three passages in the theban recension of the book of the dead we should be obliged to assume that the power to recognize the friends of earth in the next world was not enjoyed by the deceased but that he really possessed this power at least so far as his parents were concerned we learn from the one hundred and tenth chapter where the deceased addressing a pool or a lake situated in the first section of the elysian fields says o quenquitet i have entered into thee and i have seen thee 
osiris my father and i have identified my mother a delight however which he brackets with the pleasures of making love and of catching worms and serpents in the papyrus of the priestess on high we actually see the deceased lady in converse with two figures one of whom is probably her father and the other certainly her mother for above the head of the latter are written the words her mother mutes followed by the name a supplementary proof of this is afforded by a passage in the fifty-second chapter where the deceased says the god shall say unto me what manner of food wouldst thou have given unto thee and i reply let me eat my food under the sycamore tree of my lady the goddess hathor and let my times be among the divine beings who have alighted thereon let me have the power to order my own fields in tatu and my own growing crops in anu let me live upon bread made of white barley and let my ale be made from red grain and may the persons of my father and my mother be given unto me as guardians of my door and for the ordering of my territory the same idea is also expressed in the one hundred and eighty ninth chapter thus the deceased hoped to have in the next world an abundance of the material comforts which he enjoyed in this world and to meet again his own god and his father and mother as we see him frequently accompanied by his wife in several vignettes to other chapters we may assume that he would meet her again along with the children whom she bore him it will be noticed that little is said throughout the book of the dead about the spiritual occupations of the blessed dead and we are told nothing of the choirs of angels who hymn the deity everlastingly in the religious works of later western nations the dead who attained to everlasting life became in every respect like the divine inhabitants of heaven and they ate the same meat and drank the same drink and wore the same apparel and lived as they lived no classification of angels is mentioned and grades of them like cherubim and seraphim thrones powers dominions etc such as are found in the celestial hierarchy of semitic nations are unknown a celestial city constructed on the model described in the apocalypse is also unknown we have seen that the elysian fields much resemble the flat fertile lands intersected by large canals and streams of running water such as must always have existed and may still be seen in certain parts of the delta of the distance to be traversed by the dead before they were reached nothing whatever is said as the egyptian made his future world a counterpart of the egypt which he knew and loved and gave to it heavenly counterparts of all the sacred cities thereof he must have conceived the existence of a waterway like the nile with tributaries and branches whereon he might sail and perform his journeys according to some texts the abode of the dead was away beyond egypt to the north but according to others it might be either above or below the earth the oldest tradition of all placed it above the earth and the sky was the large flat or vaulted iron surface which formed its floor this iron surface was supported upon four pillars one at each of the cardinal points and its edges were some height above the earth to reach this iron ceiling of the earth and floor of heaven a ladder was thought to be necessary as we may see from the following passage in which pepi the king says homage to thee o ladder of the god homage to thee o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of the god set thyself up o ladder of set set thyself up o ladder of horus whereby osiris appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra for it is thy son pepi and this pepi is horus and thou hast given birth to this pepi even as thou hast given birth to the god who is the lord of the ladder thou hast given unto him the ladder of the god and thou hast given unto him the ladder of set whereby this pepi hath appeared in heaven when he wrought protection for ra and in another place we read pepi goeth to his mother nut there that is in heaven and he entereth therein in his name of ladder elsewhere we are told that pepi is holy he hath received his staff 
he is provided with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the double company of the gods ra acteth as his pilot in his journey to the west and he establisheth his throne for him at the head of the lords of Kaz, and he hath inscribed his name at the head of the living the pe ka which is in the waters openeth its doors to this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the heavens unbolteth its gates to this pepi pepi passeth through them having his panther skin upon him and his whip in his hand a later belief placed the abode of the departed away to the west or northwest of egypt and the souls of the dead made their way thither through a gap in the mountains on the western bank of the nile near abydos a still later belief made out that the abode of the departed was a long mountainous narrow valley with a river running along it starting from the east it made its way to the north and then taking a circular direction it came back to the east in this valley there lived all manner of fearful monsters and beasts and here was the country through which the sun passed during the twelve hours of night it is impossible to reconcile all the conflicting statements concerning the abode of the dead and the egyptians themselves held different views about it at different periods the following extracts however from the pyramid texts will show the reader what views were held by them concerning the home of the blessed dead in the next world and concerning their treatment therein by the gods behold unas cometh behold unas cometh behold unas cometh forth and if unas cometh not of his own accord thy message having come to him shall bring him unas maketh his way to his abode and the cow goddess of the great lake boweth down before him none shall ever take away his food from the great boat and he shall not be repulsed at the white house of the great ones by the region miskent on the border of the sky behold unas hath arrived at the height of heaven and he seeth his body in the semketet boat and unas laboreth therein he hath satisfied the Ureus in the mat boat and hath washed it and the hamamat beings have testified concerning him the winds and storms of heaven have strengthened him and they introduce him to ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace ra so that he may go forth towards the horizon o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace heru kuti harmachus so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon with ra o make the two horizons of heaven to embrace unas so that he may go forth towards the horizon along with haru kuti and ra this unas is happily united to his ka his panther skin and his grain bag are upon him his whip and his, is in his hand his sceptre is in his grasp they bring to him the four khus who dwell in the hair of horus who stand on the east side of heaven and are glorious by reason of their sceptres and they declare the fair name of unas to ra and they make him to escape from neheb kau and the soul of this unas liveth in the north of the seket aru and he saileth about in the lake of ka whilst this unas saileth towards the east side of the horizon whilst he saileth saileth towards the east side of heaven his sister the star septet giveth him birth in the tuat thou hast thy heart osiris thou hast thy legs osiris thou hast thine arms osiris and unas himself hath his heart and unas himself hath his legs and unas himself hath his arms he hath walked with his legs towards heaven he hath come forth with them into heaven and his mouth declareth itself by the great dew unas flieth like a feathered fowl he hovereth and alighteth like a beetle he flieth like a feathered fowl and alighteth like a beetle upon the empty seat which is in thy boat o ra kindle the fire in order that the flame may rise up and throw incense upon it in order that the smell of incense may rise up thy scent cometh towards unas incense thy scent cometh toward unas incense your scent cometh towards this unas and the scent of unas cometh towards you o ye gods unas is with you and you are with unas o ye gods unas liveth with you and you live with unas 
o ye gods love ye unas o ye gods love him o ye gods come o part of ra come o matter which cometh forth from the thighs of horus come o ye who have come forth come o ye who have come forth come o ye who are feeble come o ye who are feeble come shu come shu come shu for unas cometh forth upon the thighs of isis for unas is feeble o ye gods upon the thighs of nephthys and he hath been ejected from the womb he who setteth up the ladder for osiris is ra and he who setteth up the ladder is horus for his father osiris when he goeth forth to his soul ra is on one side and horus is on the other and unas is between them being indeed the god of holy dwelling places coming forth from the sanctuary unas standeth up and is horus unas sitteth down and is set ra receiveth him soul in heaven and body in earth those who are happy and who see unas those who are content and who contemplate unas are the gods if this god come forth towards heaven unas also shall come forth towards heaven and he shall have his souls upon him and his book shall be upon both sides of him and his inscribed amulets shall be upon his feet and the god seb shall do for him what hath been done for himself the divine souls of the city of Pe and the divine souls of the city of nekon shall come unto him along with the gods of heaven and the gods of the earth and they shall lift unas up upon their hands come forth then unas to heaven and enter therein thy name of ladder heaven hath been given unto unas and earth hath been given unto him this is the decree which tem hath issued to seb and the domains of horus and the domains of set and the second aru with their harvests adore thee in thy name of khonsu sept teta hath not hunger like shu teta hath not thirst like tefnut for hapi talmatutef queb senef and amset that is the four children of horus destroy the hunger which is in the belly of teta and this thirst which is upon the lips of teta the hunger of teta is with shu the thirst of teta is with tefnut teta liveth upon the daily bread which cometh in its season he liveth upon that upon which shu liveth and he eateth that which shu eateth filth is an abomination to teta and he rejecteth filthy water ye have taken teta to you o ye gods and he eateth what ye eat he drinketh that which ye drink he liveth upon that upon which ye live he sitteth down as ye sit he is mighty with the might which is yours he saileth about even as ye sail about the house of teta is a net in the second aru he hath streams of running water in second hetep the offerings of teta are with you o ye gods the water of teta is as wine even as is water to ra teta revolveth in heaven like ra and he goeth round about the sky like thoth the two doors of heaven are open for thee o teta for thou hast raised up thy head for thy bones and thou hast raised up thy bones for thy head thou hast opened the two doors of heaven thou hast drawn back the great bolts thou hast removed the seal of the great door and with a face like that of a jackal and a body like that of a fierce lion thou hast taken thy seat upon thy throne and thou criest to the coos come to me come to me come to horus who hath avenged his father for it is teta who will lead thee in thou puttest thy hand upon the earth and with thine arm thou doest battle in the great domain and thou revolvest there among the coos and thou standest up like osiris hail osiris tata horus hath come to embrace thee with his arms and he hath made thoth to drive away for thee in defeat the followers of set and he hath taken them captive on thy behalf and he hath repulsed the heart of set for he is stronger than set and now thou art come forth before him and seb hath watched thy journey and he hath set thee in thy place and hath led unto thee thy two sisters isis and nephthys horus hath united thee unto the gods and they show themselves as brothers unto thee in thy name sent and they do not repulse thee in thy name atert he hath granted that the gods shall guard thee and seb hath set his sandal upon the head of thine enemy thou hast driven back the enemy thy son horus hath smitten him and he hath torn out his own eye 
and given it unto thee in order that thou mayest be strong thereby and that thou mayest gain the mastery thereby among the khus horus hath permitted thee to hack thine enemy in pieces with this eye he smiteth down thine enemy with it for horus is stronger than he is and he passeth judgment upon his father who is in thee in thy name he whose father is stronger than heaven the goddess nut hath made thee to be a god unto set in thy name of god and thy mother nut hath spread out her two arms over thee in her name of coverer of heaven horus hath smitten set and he hath cast him down beneath thee and set beareth thee up and is a mighty one beneath thee inasmuch as he is the great one of the earth which he ordereth in the name of ta cha sir ta horus hath granted that set shall be judged in his heart in his house with thee and he hath granted that thou shalt smite him with thy hand when and so whensoever he doeth battle with thee hail osiris tata horus hath avenged thee and he hath caused his ka which is in thee to make thee to rest in thy name of ka hetep hail osiris tata seb hath given to thee thy two eyes that thou mayest rest in the two eyes of this great one that is osiris who is in thee seb hath made them to be given unto thee by horus that thou mayest rest upon them that isis and nephthys may see thee and that they may find thee horus hath made an offering unto thee horus hath granted that isis and nephthys may protect thee and they have handed thee over to horus that he may rest upon thee horus hath glorified thee in thy name of horizon where ra showeth himself in thy arms in the name of dweller in the palace thou hast made thy hand to be like a wall behind him behind him to give stability to his bones and to magnify his heart the right side of tata belongeth to horus who smiteth the tachen tru in his two sceptres and nephthys in the two eyes the left side of tata belongeth to set who judgeth tata hail bolt which closeth the door of nut it is tata shu who cometh forth from tem hail nu grant that the door may be opened to tata for he cometh as a divine soul nu hath adjudged tata to tem and pekah hath adjudged tata to shu he granteth that the two doors of heaven shall be opened and he hath decreed that tata shall be among men without name but behold thou hast grasped tata by the hand and thou hast drawn him to heaven so that he may never die upon earth among men o father of tata o father of tata in the darkness o father of tata tem in the darkness thou hast brought tata near thee because he hath performed the shooting forth of flame and the making protection even as the four goddesses isis nephthys neith and serkhetu did for the father of nu on the day of protecting the throne o road of horus extend thy sail for tata give thy hand to tata hail ra come for tata passeth to the shore even as thy followers the unka who love thee have passed thee stretch out thy hand to the west stretch out thy hand to tata stretch out thy hand to the east stretch out thy hand to tata even as thou hast done to the place where is the eldest son this tata is osiris and he hath motion this tata hath detestation of the earth and he will not enter into seb this tata hath broken for ever his sleep in his dwelling which is upon earth the bones of tata flourish and obstacles to him are are destroyed for he is purified with the eye of horus the obstacles which he encountered are beaten down by the two tichert goddesses that is isis and nephthys and tata hath cast to the earth his seed in kes the sister of this tata the lady of the city of pe bewaileth him and the two nurses who created osiris also create him tata is in heaven this tata is in heaven like shu and ra this tata perisheth not and nothing in him perisheth nay this tata is the governor of his leg of the first-born gods this tata sitteth not as the guardian of god the offerings of this tata are for horus and ra and the sepulchral offerings of this tata are in new this is tata and he goeth with ra this tata cometh with ra he hath embraced his habitations he giveth opposition and destroyeth it he gathereth the cause and delivereth them this tata watcheth and lieth down and he hath destroyed the two anuti in 
unu the foot of this tata departeth not and the heart of this tata is not repulsed rise up tata and lift up thy legs o most mighty one to go and seat thyself among the gods and do thou that which osiris has done in the house of the prince which is in anu thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and none shall set bounds to thy foot in heaven and none shall repulse thee on earth the khus who are the children of nut whom nephthys hath suckled have gathered together to thee thou standest up upon thy strength and thou doest that which thou must do for thy khu in the presence of all the khus thou goest to the city of pei thou art glorified and returnest thou goest to the city of nekin thou art glorified and returnest thou doest that which osiris did and behold this most mighty khu teta tata is upon his throne and standeth up being provided with all things like the goddess sam ur none shall repulse thee in any place wherein thou wouldst enter and none shall set bounds to thy foot concerning any place wherein it pleaseth thee to be hail osiris tata stand up rise up for thy mother nut hath brought thee forth and seb hath placed thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have defended thee and they have set thine enemy beneath thee thou hast borne that which is greater than thou art through them in thy name atef mahur which is greater than thou art in thy name of ta abtu thy two sisters isis and nephthys come to thee and they make thee to pass by quent ert in thy name of quem ur and aneb uchet ert in thy name of uach mu they thy sister isis came to thee with thy members and thou wert united into her and thou didst give her seed and didst provide her with offspring like septet hail hail rise up tata thou hast received thy head thou hast embraced thy bones thou hast gathered together thy flesh and blood and thou goest round about the earth seeking for food thou hast received thy bread which decayeth never and thy beer which goeth bad never thou standest at the gates which drive back the wrecked kent mentef cometh forth unto thee he graspeth thee by the hand and he leadeth thee to heaven to thy father seb who is glad when he meeteth thee he giveth thee his two hands he maketh himself a brother unto thee he feedeth thee he setteth thee among the khus who never perish and the beings whose habitations are hidden make adoration unto thee rise up then o thou tata who never diest of the exudations which have fallen from the eye of horus upon the branches of the olive tree of the two horus gods who are in the temples o mighty lord of divine food in anu thou givest bread to tata and thou givest beer to tata thou makest tata to flourish thou makest his offerings to flourish and thou makest his to flourish if tata suffereth hunger the two lying gods suffer hunger if tata suffereth thirst thy mother nekebet suffereth thirst tata maketh broad the throne with seb tata lifteth on high the vault of heaven with ra tata walketh round about in seket hetep tata is the eye of ra who lieth down and is born each day homage to thee o ra in thy beauty in thy splendours in thy seats and in thy plenitude thou hast brought the milk of isis to tata and the water of the celestial stream of nephthys and power to journey over the great green sea and life and strength and health and the pleasures of love and bread and beer and apparel and everything whereon tata liveth and power to hearken to the gods who speak throughout the day and to rest with them during the night and to partake of the offerings which are made unto them tata looketh upon thee when thou goest forth in the form of thoth leading the boat of ra to the fields which are in asu and when thou goest in among those who bear him up homage to thee o tata on this thy day whereon thou standest up before ra who cometh forth from the east and who clotheth thee in thy spiritual body sa among the souls anubis governor of amenti giveth thee thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of beer thousands of vases of oil thousands of oxen thousands of changes of apparel and thousands of bulls for thee is the smen goose slain for thee is the therp goose shot with an arrow horus hath destroyed all the evil which is in tata by his four children and set forgetteth what he wrought against tata by means of his eight fiends and those whose habitations are hidden throw open the doors to him 
rise thou go to the earth and seek the things which have issued from thee rise thou up and pass thou on opposite to the khus thy two wings are like those of a hawk and thy hair is like the rays of a star cast ye nothing evil upon teta neither do ye carry off the heart of teta nor steal away the place wherein it abideth hail thou pepi thou journeyest on thou art glorious thou hast gotten power like the god who is on his throne that is osiris thou hast thy soul within thy body thou hast thy power behind thee thy urarit crown is upon thy head thy head dress is upon thy shoulders thy face is in front of thee those who acclaim thee are upon both sides of thee the followers of the god are following after thee the spiritual bodies sahu of the god are upon both sides of thee and they make the god to come the god cometh and pepi cometh upon the throne of osiris the khu which dwelleth in the city of natat cometh the form which dwelleth in the nome of teni isis speaketh with thee and nephthys holdeth converse with thee the khus come unto thee paying homage unto thee and they bow down even to the ground at thy feet by reason of thy book o pepi in the cities of sa thou comest forth before thy mother nut and she strengtheneth thine arm and she giveth unto thee a path in the horizon to the place where ra is the doors of heaven are open for thee the gates of quebhu are unbolted for thee thou findest ra who guardeth thee and he strengtheneth for thee thy hand and he guideth thee into the northern and southern heavens and he setteth thee upon the throne of osiris hail thou pepi the eye of horus cometh unto thee and holdeth converse with thee thy soul which dwelleth with the gods cometh unto thee and thy form sekum which dwelleth among the khus cometh unto thee in the same way that the son avenged his father in the same way that horus avenged osiris even so shall horus avenge pepi upon his enemies and thou shalt stand there o pepi avenged and armed and provided with the forms of osiris who is upon the throne of the governor of amenti and thou shalt have thy being as he hath his among the indestructible khus and thy soul shall stand up upon thy throne provided with thy attributes and it shall have its being as thou hast thine in the presence of him who is the governor of the living according to the decree of ra the great god who shall plough the wheat and the barley and give it unto thee as a gift therein hail thou pepi it is ra who hath given unto thee all life and strength for ever along with thy speech and thy body and thou hast received the attributes of the god and thou hast become great therein before the gods who dwell on the lake hail thou pepi thy soul standeth among the gods and among the khus and the fear of thee constraineth their hearts hail pepi inasmuch as thou hast set thyself upon thy throne of the governor of the living thy book it is which worketh upon their hearts and thy name liveth upon earth and groweth old upon earth and thou shalt neither perish nor decay for ever and ever rise thou up o pepi stand thou up o thou of great strength and take thy seat at the head of the gods and do thou the things which osiris did in the house of the prince in anu heliopolis thou hast received thy spiritual body sa and thy foot shall not be restrained in heaven and thou shalt not be repulsed upon earth and behold the khus who are the children of nut to whom nephthys hath given suck have gathered themselves together unto thee and thou standest up on thy strength and thou doest that which it is thine to do in the presence of thy coup for all the coups thou journeyest to the city of pei and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou goest to the city of nekin and thou doest what must be done therein and thou returnest thou doest that which osiris did and thou art upon his throne and this coup the one most mighty standeth up armed like smile er and wherever thou goest more shall repulse thee none shall repulse thee repulse thee and none shall set a limit to thy feet wherever it pleaseth thee to go hail osiris pepi arise stand up for thy mother nut hath given birth unto thee and seb hath arranged thy mouth for thee the great company of the gods have avenged thee and they have put thine enemies beneath thee thou hast carried that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of atef me ur and thou hast netted that which is greater than thyself through them in thy name of ta tani thy two sisters isis and nephthys come unto thee and they make thee to traverse kemturt and thy name of kem ur and aneb uchit ert in thy name of uach ur and verily thou art ert shent in shanur and teben shent in teben peshur he nebu shent at in shen a sekmu 
and isis and nephthys have protected thee in the city of sot from their master who is in thee in thy name of master of sot and from their god who is in thee in thy name of god they adore thee so that thou mayest not depart from them in thy name of morning star and they bring offerings before thee so that thou mayest not suffer pain in thy name of tchen true thy sister isis hath come unto thee rejoicing in thy love and thou hast had intercourse with her and hast made her to conceive and she is heavy with septet and hero sept cometh forth from thee as heru the dweller in septet and thou doest what must be done in him in thy name of ku dweller in tchentru and he avengeth thee in his name of horus the son who avengeth his father hail osiris pepi thou hast offered thy libation and thou hast made thy libation before horus in the name of comer forth from keb thou hast offered thine incense which maketh thee divine and thy mother nut hath made thee to be as a god to thine enemy in thy name of god thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that the gods which whithersoever thou goest thou hast offered the emanations which come forth from thee and horus hath granted that thou shalt judge his children wheresoever thou takest them and he decreeth for thee the renewals of youth in thy name of water of youth horus hath strength then and he judgeth his father in thee in his name of heru bat hail pepi thy journeying and thy and the journeying of thy mothers along with thee are the journeying of horus when he journeyeth forth and the journeying of his mothers who journey with him those who are with him urge him on and they lead him to the east hail thou pepi thine arms are ua pau and thy face is ab uat hail thou pepi a royal oblation thou seatest thyself in the regions of horus and thou goest about through the regions of set thou seatest thyself upon the iron throne and thou art judge at the head of the great company of the gods who dwell in anu hail thou pepi kent an marti or mat mati guardeth thee whilst thou guardest thy calves hail pepi ar guardeth thee against the coups hail pepi know that thou shalt receive for thine holy oblation which thou offerest each day thousands of cakes thousands of vessels of ale thousands of oxen thousands of feathered fowl thousands of sweet things and thousands of linen garments hail pepi thou hast thy water thou hast thine abundance thou hast thy purifying gums which are brought to thee before thy brother nekek o osiris pepi thou risest as king of the south and of the north by reason of thy power over the gods and their cause that is doubles and behold do thou o nut spread thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him and deliver him from set come o nut and protect thy son for thou must protect this mighty one o nut cast thyself over thy son osiris pepi and protect him o great wife of this mighty one who is among thy children the god seb hath come unto thee o nut and thou didst possess strength and thou didst gain power in the womb of thy mother tefnut when as yet thou wert not born o oh, do thou unite life and strength unto pepi so that he may not die thou didst make strong thy heart and didst spring forth from the womb of thy mother in thy name of nut o oh, thou daughter who didst gain the mastery over thy mother and didst make herself to rise as queen of the north protect thou this pepi who is within thy womb that he may not die for me o oh, nut to whom thou hast given birth proclaim the name of osiris pepi through horus beloved of the two lands pepi the king of the north and of the south pepi the lord of the diadems of the vulture and of the uraeus beloved from the womb pepi the triple hawk of gold pepi the flesh and bone of seb by whom he is beloved pepi the friend of all the gods pepi the giver of all life and stability and power and health and joy of heart like the sun living for ever thy water is thine thy flood is thine that is to say the emanations which come forth from the god the excretions which come forth from osiris thy hands are washed thine ears are opened and this form sekum doeth what hath to be done for his son thou art washed and thy ka double is washed and thy ka hath sat down and he eateth bread with thee for ever and ever inasmuch as thou hast gone and hast taken thy seat o osiris thy mouth is open before thee acclamations are upon thy hand thy nostrils are gratified with the odour of the uraeus thy legs walk to keep the feast thy teeth are and thy fingers reckon up the lakes over which thou passest like the great bull of anu and of the gnome of uachit to go to the fields of ra which he loveth rise up then o pepi and die not 
hail pepi arise stand out thou art pure thy ka is pure thy soul is pure thy sekum is pure thy mother cometh to thee thy mother not the mighty creatress cometh to thee and she maketh thee pure o pepi she fashioneth thee o pepi and thou hast motion o pepi and thou art pure thy ka is pure thy sekum is pure among the khus and thy soul is pure among the gods o pepi hail pepi thy bones have been presented unto thee thou hast received thy head before seb and he hath destroyed the evil which belongeth to thee o pepi before tem thou hast opened the gates of heaven thou hast unbolted the doors of kabu which repulse the beings of understanding reket and ment acclaimeth thee mankind and memet greeteth thee and the stars which never fail stand up before thee thy winds are incense and thy north wind is a flame for thou art he who hath become mighty in the nome teni and thou art the star that existeth by thyself and which appeareth in the cast eastern half of heaven which never groweth old and to which horus of the city of tot hath given his body hail thou established one thou most exalted one among the stars which never fail thou shalt never perish the heavens speak and the earth quaketh by reason of thy book o osiris when thou makest thine appearance hail ye cows of amutenen who have suckled amutenen go ye round about behind him and weep before him and acclaim him by word and deed for pepi who goeth forth goeth into heaven among his brethren the gods pepi is pure pepi hath taken his staff he hath provided himself with his throne and he hath taken his seat in the boat of the great and little companies of the gods ra transporteth pepi to the west and he establisheth the throne of pepi above the lords of cause and he writeth down pepi at the head of the living the pe ka which dwelleth in keb is opened unto this pepi and the iron which formeth the ceiling of the sky is opened unto this pepi and he passeth through onwards his panther skin is upon him and his sceptre and flail are in his hand and pepi is sound with his flesh he is happy with his name he liveth with his ka and he ra destroyeth the evil which is upon both sides of pepi he driveth away the evil which followeth him even as ma utu who dwelleth in sekum driveth away the evil which is upon both sides of him and doeth away with the evil which followeth him let ra be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth therein before herukuti harmachus let herukuti be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he may go forth before ra let pepi be embraced in the two horizons of heaven so that he himself may go forth before ra and before herokuti o enter into the verdant stream of the lake of ka o fill with water the fields of aru and let pepi set sail for the eastern half of heaven towards that place where the gods are brought forth wherein pepi himself may be borne along with them as herokuti for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and the ka of pepi acclaimeth the gods and they invoke pepi and they bring to him these four gods who make their ways over the tresses of horus and who stand with their sceptres in the eastern half of heaven and they declare to ra the excellent name of pepi and they exalt the excellent name of pepi before neheb kau for pepi is triumphant and pepi acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods the sister of pepi is septet sothis and the birth of pepi is the morning star and it is he who is under the body of heaven before ra pepi is triumphant and he acclaimeth and his ka acclaimeth the gods pepi knoweth his mother and he is not unmindful of her the white crown who begetteth and who dwelleth in the city of mekheb she is the lady of the great house the lady of the land of union the lady of the hidden land the lady of the field of the boat the lady of the lake which bringeth offerings she decreeth the red crown she is the lady of the domains of the city of tep o mother of this pepi cry out and present the breast to him and suckle him o thou her son pepi o father the breast hath been presented unto thee and it hath suckled thee o father thou livest o father thou art little o father thou comest forth into heaven like the hawks having feathers like unto those of geese o father it is the god hetch hetch who bringeth these things to pepi o sema ur thou bull of offerings remove thy horn and let this pepi pass by inasmuch as pepi passeth through thee and inasmuch as he goeth to heaven in full life and power this pepi seeth his father this pepi seeth ra
this pepi is indeed god and the envoy or angel of god pepi cometh and he is pure in seket aru this pepi goeth down to the field of kenset and the followers of horus purify him they guard carefully this pepi and they recite for him the chapter of mao and they also recite for him the chapter of coming forth in life and in power this pepi cometh forth to heaven in life and in power in the boat and in the boat of ra he he piloteth for ra the gods thereof and they rejoice in this pepi as they rejoice when ra goeth forth from the eastern part of the sky in peace in peace this pepi cometh forth to the eastern part of heaven where the gods are born and where he himself is born as heru kuti pepi is triumphant maa ziru and the ka of pepi is triumphant pepi maketh adoration and the ka of pepi maketh adoration the sister of this pepi is septet he is born as the morning star he goeth with you and he journeyeth with you in second aru and he draweth nigh as do you unto the field of turquoise he eateth of that of which ye eat he liveth upon that upon which ye live he putteth on apparel like unto the apparel which ye put on he anointeth himself with the sweet-smelling substances with which ye anoint yourselves he receiveth his water with you at the lake of mena of this pepi and he drinketh it out of the vessels of the khus ra hath purified heaven and horus hath purified the earth and every god who is with them purifieth this pepi for pepi adoreth the god o thou path of pepi which leadeth to the great halls testify ye concerning pepi before these two great gods for pepi is unka the son of ra who beareth the heavens upon his shoulders and who guideth the earth hail ye gods let pepi take his seat among you hail ye stars bear ye pepi upon your shoulders as ye bear ra follow ye this pepi as ye follow apuat and love ye him as ye love this pepi hath come to thee o lord of heaven this pepi hath come to thee o cyrus he strengtheneth thy face and he arrayeth thee in the garment of a god he hath purified thee in ayata he hath destroyed the members of thine enemies he hath hacked them in pieces and he hath changed himself into the being who is among those who have been hacked in pieces for horus the son of whom thou hast given birth hath not placed this pepi among the dead but among the divine gods their water is the water of this pepi their bread is the bread of this pepi their purifications are the purifications of this pepi and that which horus hath done for osiris he hath also done for this pepi heaven uttereth words the earth quaketh seb advanceth the two divine gnomes part asunder the ceremony of ploughing the earth is ended and the offering is set before pepi the living one the established one he goeth forth from heaven and goeth about over the iron sky in life and stability he saileth over it and overthroweth in his course the fortifications of shu he goeth forth to heaven upon his wings like a mighty duck which hath broken its bonds and anubis leadeth the procession which horus made in abydos when osiris was interred he goeth forth into heaven among the stars which never perish or diminish his sister is septet and his guide the morning star leadeth him to seket hetep and he seateth himself there upon his iron throne which hath lions heads and feet in the form of the hoofs of the bull semar he standeth up there in his vacant place between the two great gods and his sceptre which is in the form of a papyrus he hath with him he stretcheth out his hand over the hemen met beings and the gods come to him bending their backs in homage the two great gods watch one on each side of him and they find pepi like the great and little companies of the gods acting as the judge of words being the prince over every prince they bow down before pepi and they make offerings unto him as unto the great and little companies of the gods hail o cyrus it is not pepi who entreateth to see thee in the form in which thou art pepi hath gone down into the great green sea and thou o great green sea hast dropped thy head and bent thy back and the children of nut who come down upon thee putting their garlands upon their heads and round their necks offer the flowers which are the crowns of the pools of seket hetep to isis the great lady and the goddess who beareth the pike in akhet bringeth them and spreadeth them out as a gift before her son horus whom she suckleth at the breast so that he may traverse the earth in his two white sandals and may go to his father osiris pepi hath opened out his way among the birds he hath travelled with the lords of food he hath gone to the great lake which is in seket hetep on which the great gods alight and these great and imperishable beings give to him the tree of life whereupon they themselves whereon they themselves do live that he also may eat and live thereon 
take then this pepi with thee to this great country which hath become subject unto thee by the will of the gods wherein thou eatest during the night even until dawn and where thou becomest master of divine food in such wise that pepi may eat of that of which thou eatest that he may drink of that of which thou drinkest the following prayer which is found in shortened forms in graeco roman and roman periods occurs in the text of pepi the second hail great company of the gods who are in anu grant that pepi nefer ka ra may flourish and grant that his pyramid his everlasting building may flourish even as the name of temu the governor of the great company of the gods flourisheth if the name of shu the lord of the upper shrine in anu flourisheth pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of tefnut the lady of the lower shrine in anu is established the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall be established and his pyramid shall be established for ever if the name of seb the soul of the earth flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and his everlasting building shall flourish if the name of nut flourisheth in het shenth in anu the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris flourisheth the nome teni the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of osiris governor of amenti flourisheth the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of set in nupt ambus flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of horus of Bahutet flourisheth the name of pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of ra flourisheth in the horizon the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of kent merti in sekum is established the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever if the name of uat Chit, who dwelleth in tep flourisheth the name of this pepi nefer ka ra shall flourish and this his pyramid shall flourish and this his building shall flourish for ever end of introduction the elysian fields